So Philippians chapter 3, we've been looking at Philippians chapter 3 and pretty much dancing around verse 12 to 14. It says this, it's Paul, the apostle writing. He says, not that I've already obtained all this. He's just spoken about uh, his pursuit of God. He wants to know God. Anyone else want to know God? I love his language. He says, I want to know about God. Um, I've got a whole bunch of, anyone like autobiographies? I love autobiographies. If you came to my house, I've got a whole shelf of them, of, of, from you know, Christian leaders to rock stars to um, you know, politicians, different people. They're all kind of there on the shelf. And I love autobiographies, but when I finish an autobiography, what I can say safely is I know about that person, but I cannot say I know that person. There's a difference, isn't there? I can know about somebody, but there's a difference between knowing about somebody and, and getting to know about somebody and actually getting to know that somebody, getting to know that person. And Paul's passion and heart, he, he, he talks about in Philippians, is that he says, I want to know Christ. And, and know in that Greek sense is, is not just a head knowledge, it's not just information, it's, it's experiential knowledge. I want to know, move towards and actually experience the truth that I'm saying I want to know. So when Paul talks about knowing God, what he's saying is I want to experience God in my life. Anyone want to experience God in their life? Yep. Uh, uh, the great thing about Christianity is we do not follow our cleverly devised fables. Amen? We're not just following a philosophy that seems to make a lot of sense or, or a bunch of rules that kind of, because, because we're, you know, I'm kind of a good person, I don't like all the bad things, so this set of rules fits me, I'll live that way because it's easy for me to do that because I don't like, it's, it's not about that. It's not what we follow. And, and so Paul talks about wanting to know God. He says, I want to actually experience God. It's, it, there's this crazy passage in Genesis where it says that Adam and Eve, when he created Adam and Eve, that God would come and walk with them in the garden. Isn't that crazy? What a crazy thought that God would come and walk with them. Now, uh, we, don't, we don't know. Nobody knows whether it literally meant God had a body and two legs and feet and walked. We don't know. Uh, but what we do know is the best way for the writer to describe what was going on between man and God was to paint a picture of God actually walking with them. That tells me that there's some kind of encounter experience, some kind of knowing of God that, that happens when we start following Jesus. It's not just uh, all about facts and figures and thoughts. There, there, there's a place. Jesus talks about peace I leave with you, peace. I give you. How many of you know peace is not a head thing? Peace is a heart thing. Jesus actually said, I can give you peace. In other words, you can experience something that I want to give you. You'll experience something in your heart that you can't experience apart from me. He says, I want to give you a kind of peace. Well, well peace is, is, is an experience. It's an encounter. It's something shifting internally. It's not just all about out here. And so Paul says, I want to know Christ. He goes on and unpacks that, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, be conformed to his death. So he's talking about this. And then he lands in, 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 in verse 12 and 14. He says, it's not that I've already obtained all this. I'm not there yet. I haven't got there or have already arrived at my goal. I love the fact that he said, I have a goal. He's got a goal. We've all got a goal for life, don't we? And Paul's goal was, he said, my goal is not to have a bigger house. My goal is not to, to, to get the latest Lexus or Honda or whatever it is that you drive. My goal is not to uh, you know, climb the corporate ladder. That's not my goal. It can be a goal. We can have goals like that. Nothing wrong with that in life. But Paul says, that's not my main goal. That's not the goal of my life. It's not the thing that I'm putting all my energy and time into. I want to, I, I, if you can climb the corporate ladder, do it. If you can get a better house, do it. A faster car, do it. No problem with any of that. He's not dissing any of that stuff. But what he's saying is my main goal, my main purpose is I want to know Christ. And if, if pursuing that stuff is going to stop you from knowing Christ, then don't pursue it. That's the bottom line of Paul's passion and Paul's heart. But Paul says, I haven't got there yet. I haven't obtained all this and I haven't arrived at my goal. But what I do do, he says, but I press on. I press on. I keep going. I keep going. I don't give up. I don't, I, I don't lose my passion. I don't get discouraged. I don't uh, 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 let my fire go completely out. I, I keep pressing. I keep moving forward. I'm pressing on. I'm still heading in that direction. I'm not getting apathetic and spiritually lazy here. I'm going after God. I've had setbacks and things that have happened to him. This is a guy that has been shipwrecked and a guy that's been whipped and a guy that's been beaten. And I'm sure that when the whip's about to come down, he probably prayed, Lord, I'd love it if you could teleport me somewhere else. Like, you know, my brother Peter, you took him out of prison one day when he's in the stocks and, and so on. And well, why don't you do that for me? And the next thing you know, he feels whip, whip, whip. And he's thinking, oh man, you did it for Peter. He didn't get discouraged by all that stuff. He didn't, he didn't see the bad things and the tough things in life as evidence of God's absence and him not being there. He just kept pressing on. He just kept on pressing on. He says, I'm pressing on because I want to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And then he says this, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. I haven't reached that goal yet. Some translations say, I do not consider myself yet to have apprehended anything. But this one thing, 
this one thing I do. In the Greek, it literally reads on, I haven't considered myself to have taken hold of anything except this one thing. We, we, you know, we added the full stops and all the little things. What it actually says in the Greek is that I don't consider myself to have taken hold of anything except this one thing. That's what he's saying. And then he unpacks that one thing and he tells us what the one thing is. He says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize. They would say win. Win. There's nothing wrong with, with trying to be a winner. Amen? I know that everyone gets a ribbon today, all right? And, and by everybody getting a ribbon, it kind of brings down those that do put in effort and try really hard and want to succeed. But, you know, we don't want those people to feel that they're, they're, they're more successful than the people that didn't go. Hey, some of us are good at some things, aren't we? And some of us just aren't at others, yeah? Some of us are, uh, uh, some of us are really, really academic and we're going to make it through university, become doctors. Some of us, it doesn't matter how much we want to, we're just not quite there yet. Case in point, not that I ever wanted to be a doctor, but I was not going to make it into uni. I tried. I, I applied for university, as did all of my friends. Every single one of us, a big group. They all wanted to go into uni to be business people and physiotherapists. I wanted to go to uni because I heard there were cracker parties at university. <laughs> So I, I, I went through the whole thing and, and I remember I was at Sydney uh, at the Coogee Bay Hotel with a bunch of mates that morning when the newspaper came out. This is back in the day where they published the university entrance in the newspaper. Remember those days? You, used to, you didn't get a notification via email because what was email? It wasn't existent. And so anyway, so I remember getting the newspaper out and we're going through it, me and my four or five mates and all their names are in there and, and to nobody's surprise, my name was not there. So... <coughs> I didn't get in there. God was not performing miracles for me yet. I didn't know him and I wasn't following him at the time. And I'm glad I didn't because I might not be here um, doing what I'm doing if I, if I had have, um, you know, got everything I wanted when I was um, not walking with the Lord. But Paul says that I'm pressing on and he says, I press toward the goal to win the prize. I love, I love the fact that he says I want to win the prize. That tells me that he had passion and he had commitment. He said, I'm going to do, basically he's saying, I'm going to do whatever it takes. Now, what's he talking about? He's saying, I'm going to forget some things and press on. And then he says, I'll do whatever it takes. In other words, what he's saying is, I'll forget whatever I got to. I'll lay down whatever I have to to win. I'll, I'll put to the side whatever I have to to get to the goal of knowing Christ more and more and more. Now, when Paul says forgetting, by the way, let's clarify this. Forgetting does not mean that you can just... How many of you know you can't just... We're just not going to remember it. I'm going to choose not to remember it. Well, you've just chosen to remember what you're not going to remember, so you've just remembered it. So you can't really just choose not to remember something, can you? What he's talking about is choose to forget. In other words, what he's saying is don't allow that thing to determine and dictate the next step in life that you're going to take. Yes, it happened. Yes, it's a part of your story. Yes, it's a part of your past, whatever. But there are some things back there that if you don't choose to forget them, then you'll continue to give them the power to hold it onto you and they will not let you walk forward into the life that God has for you. More, more scripturally, what Paul's talking about is they won't let you walk forward to know Christ more and more. They'll hold you back from that relationship. And that's what we've been talking about for the last few weeks is, is letting go of that stuff, pressing on and forgetting things so that we can move forward into all that God has for us. And we've looked at a couple of things in the last couple of weeks. We've looked at forgetting our past sins. Uh, without re-going over that, some of us have sins, things we've committed in the past. We know that they are, uh, are, are things that God is not pleased with. And some of us, we, we, we know we're born again, we're, we know that God's forgiven us and so on, but we still allow the, the, the pain of that, the pang of that, whatever that thing is that we did, to hold us back and not let us go forward. We start moving forward in freedom and then we get reminded, oh yeah, but you know. And Paul would have understood this because before Paul came to Christ, he was a pretty uh, atrocious human being when it came to the Christian faith and to Jesus. He tried to destroy this movement that we're all a part of now called the church, or back then it was called the way. He tried to destroy that. No wonder whether, as he's sitting down writing this, that he says, you know, I've had to, one thing I've learned, I've got to forget, forgetting what's behind. I've got to forget that I tried to kill these guys. Now I'm trying to preach, going, hey, Jesus loves you. I tried to kill you all for your faith once upon a time. I can imagine that would play on a person's mind. So he had to forget past sins, and some of us have to forget our past sins as well in order to move forward. Last week, we talked about forgetting past hurts. Some of us have hurts and things that have happened in our life. And you know what? Some things get restored in life, don't they? Sometimes God will answer a prayer. Sometimes God will take away the pain of a moment. Sometimes God will, 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 will restore you. You might have gone bankrupt, and then God gives you a business idea, and you're a billionaire again. Or, or you might have been uh, physically uh, injured, and, 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 and God did a miracle healing for you. He might have done that. But, but, but there's a lot of people that don't get every single thing restored when they come to faith. Sometimes I think we have this picture of Christianity, come to God and he will right every wrong, restore everything. And here's the thing, he will one day, but that day is not right now. 
That day's not right now necessarily. Could be, could be your day today. I'm not saying it's not going to be. What I'm saying is that there's no promise in the Bible that says everything will be restored this side of heaven. I'm going to have everything restored that side of heaven, not necessarily this side of heaven. I was brought up in a broken home. My mother and father uh, uh, got together, uh, realised it wasn't working. They tried, you know, a week here, a week there, had a couple of kids and so on. So I'm the product of what you would call a broken home. I lived with my mother for a period. That didn't really work out, caused a lot of damage. Lived with my dad for a bit. That didn't really work out, caused some damage. Ended up leaving both of them and moving in with another family. If I could go, if Jesus stood in front of me right now and said, I'll give you one wish, one thing in your past, go back and do, I would say this, give me a mum and a dad. Let me grow up with both at home. That, that's still a pain point for me. But I can't stay there. I've got to move forward. I can't use that as an excuse for not being a good father to my kids or a good uh, husband to my wife. I can't stay in that place. And some of us have hurts and things in the past that we're still hanging on to. And here's the thing. Until you let go of that hurt, that hurt will not let go of you. And so we've got to let go of some of that stuff. So we talked about that last week. I want to just move forward this week and talk about the next one, which is a little bit um, tilt, tilt for your head, but just stick with me and we'll, we'll, we'll land somewhere in the end. The third thing I think we've got to forget and get past is this. We've got to forget our past identity. We've got to forget our past identity. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 and 8, if you go back a bit, Paul says this, speaking about his own uh, 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 ways at trying. He's speaking here about his, his efforts to try to please God. But there's identity in the things that we do, amen? Things that we do, we create an identity. And he says this, he says, though I myself have reasons to be confident, he's speaking about within himself and his own efforts and his own abilities. He says, if anyone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness, based on the law, I was faultless. And watch verse 7. But whatever were gains to me, that word gains in the Greek means whatever was to my advantage. He says, these things I've just told you about, they were back, back in my old life, those things were advantage to me. They opened doors for me. They, ga- they, they got me platforms. They gave me people's attention. They were all advantageous to me and to where I was heading in life and so on. He says, these things were advantageous to me. He says, but now I consider them loss. The word loss in the Greek literally means damaging. So he's saying that all these things that in my past, I built this identity and this reputation and all all that reputation opened up doors for me over here. But what I understand now is, is that reputation, that identity that I'd built up that opened doors for me before I came to faith, now I realize if I keep focusing on that identity, it's gonna cause damage in my life because it will keep me from what God has. If I keep trying to fight and hold and maintain the identity I once had, and I don't realize that that identity has changed now. There's been a transfer now that I've come to faith in Christ. If I fight for that identity, he said, I'm never going to fully embrace my true identity as a follower of Christ, as a believer in Jesus. He says, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing, there it is again, of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. And I consider them garbage. Is that the word up there? You know what the word literally means in the Greek? I can't say it here. Or can't. Excrement. It means excrement. That's literally what the Greek word means. He said, all these things I consider them excrement that I may gain Christ. That's how passionate he is about going after Jesus and letting go of all the earthly stuff down here. Nothing wrong with all the earth. There's nothing wrong with anything that Paul said there. Being, being flawless with the Lord. There's nothing wrong with that per se. It's not a bad thing to want to walk in holiness. It's not a bad thing to want but, but the point that he's making is if, if I'm getting my identity in all those things that I'm doing and all those things that I've done, he said, what was advantageous to me, now I've become a Christian. If I don't transfer my identity and I keep trying to build that identity, it's going to pull me away from my true identity as a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ. So what he's saying is if I hold on, try to hold on to my old old identity, it'll stop me from embracing my new one. It's like the parable of the prodigal son. Um, One of the sons thought that he'd done everything to lose his identity, hadn't he? He left home, he went away, and he squandered his wealth, and he came back with his tail between his legs, with his head down, rehearsed a speech and said, I'm not your son anymore, I'm a slave now, right? He he, he honestly believed that he had lost, whatever he had done, he had the capacity to lose his identity, and he'd lost it. And then, of course, he has a brother that's going to the father, hang on a second, I've done all these things right, and I've dotted the I's, crossed all the T's, and so on, and the brother's thinking that he's done enough to earn his identity as a son to the father. But what they both missed out is that while one thought that they had lost, done enough to lose their identity, another one thought they'd done enough to earn their identity, 
The other thought that he had everything to earn his identity, but neither son had learnt to simply receive his identity. And this is the thing between the difference between identity in the world and identity before I came to faith and now my identity in Christ. I had to earn and work and create an identity apart from God. When we come to faith in Jesus, we don't earn an identity by reading lots of Bible. We don't have to earn an identity by turning up to church every Sunday. We don't earn an identity by being the biggest giver in the church. We don't earn an identity by having hour long you know, longer hours of prayer than any. We don't, we don't earn identity. This is the beautiful thing about Christ is he doesn't get us to earn, he gives us identity. He says, you are my son and you are my daughter. He gives us identity. Identity in the kingdom is not earned, it's simply received by faith, amen? I mean, that should give us all a spiritual collective... Oh, if you're doing things to try to earn love and try to earn identity in Christ, if you're, 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 you're trying to be more religious or trying to be more whatever uh, just to try to earn identity, then, then, then you're, you're working against Christ because he's not going to give it to you if you think you can earn it. He's not going to let you fully comprehend and understand that because he doesn't want you to think that you earned it because if you feel like you earned it, then as soon as you slip up, you're going to feel like you've unearned it. And you're going to go from feeling really proud because look at what I did. I earned this identity, the right to wear the Jesus badge. And then when you fail, you'll start condemning yourself because, oh, no, I've just lost the badge. And it's not about that. It's about the grace and the glory and the beauty of Jesus and the kindness of the Father that when we come to him in faith, we don't become perfect. We, don't, we haven't all of a sudden become super spiritual holy beings. But when he looks at us, he sees Christ upon us. So when he looks at us, he sees his son. He sees that identity that he places upon us as sons and daughters of God. It's not something that we have to earn. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come and the old has passed. You're literally, in the Greek, that literally means brand spanking new. I want you to imagine, my, my dad used to buy old cars. Uh, anyone's dad used to buy old, like they had to be like 100 years old with covered in rust and holes and everything like that, and it was a bargain. Son, it's a bargain. I got it for 20 bucks. It's like, Dad, that's why you got it for 20 bucks. Look at the thing, you know? But anyway, he used to love getting these things. He would patch them up, and he would do these things up, and he would restore them, and to, be, to his credit, at the end of the day, some of these things looked really, really good. So you can take something that's old and restore it, but that's not what this word means in the Greek. What this word means is literally a brand spanking new car. That's what it means. It's not a souped up, cleaned up version of the old. So when you come to faith in Christ, it literally means you are now a brand spanking new creation. The slate has been wiped clean. Well, it wasn't even wiped clean. It's a brand new slate. That's what it means when, when Paul writes to the Corinthians. He says, that's what happened. If anyone put their faith in Christ in this room? Any, anybody giving their lives to Jesus? Anybody following Jesus? There's three of us. Awesome. That's great. I love preaching to people that don't know Jesus. So I'm going to keep going with this. <laughs> eh? Either that or we've done a really bad job for the last nine years. I'm not sure. So we've got a fresh start. Galatians 3, 26 to 29. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. We're children of God through faith, not through works, not through effort. Children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The point he's making there is not that there's no two genders. Please, sorry, don't jump on that. He's not saying there's no such thing as male and female. What he's making is each of these groups had distinctions and barriers between them. What he's saying is the barriers have all been pulled down now. Amen. We're all one in Christ now. This is the point he's, he's, he's making. He's saying we're all one in Christ. Those distinctive barriers, those, so it, 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 these groups had barriers that kept them apart from each other. Cultural, religious, whatever. He said, I've removed those barriers. In God, we are all sons and daughters. In God, we are one. This is what he's saying. Now, we need to let go of our past identity and all the glory that came with our past identity. And we need to recenter and refocus our lives and ourselves around Christ. Because that's where our identity is now found. But practically, what does that actually mean? You ever hear people say, oh, my identity in Christ? You ever, yeah? Well, what does it mean? Like, it's one thing to say, my identity in Christ. It's another thing. How many of you have ever gotten scriptures on your identity and you just speak them over yourself and quote them over yourself and so until the cows come home? But deep down inside, you still feel a disconnect between the reality of that and what you're saying. 
So there's more to it than just running around quoting scriptures. Oh, I'm, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that. I think there's an element to finding identity in Christ and receiving and walking in that identity that we've maybe overlooked and missed. And I just, in the, in the few minutes we've got left, I want to draw your attention to this. So how, how do you find your identity in Christ? Well, here's what I think. I think you find its fullest expression in Christ's community. You find your fullest expression in Christ's community. In other words, if you're trying to find your identity in Christ outside of the community of Christ, you're going to struggle. You're going to find it very, very hard to do that. Have you ever noticed a lot of the passages that talk about identity in the New Testament? Have you ever read them slowly and looked at the communal nature of what's being said? Um, Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance. I would have pulled that out, Alan, and said that to your mate when he said, I've done good works. Because what that scripture tells me is that we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That means your good works don't balance the ledger in your favor. They just keep it level. You've earned nothing. That's what he's saying. So don't think your good works are going to give you more favor with God. You were created for good works. When you're doing good works, you're just doing what you were made for. The the, The ledger doesn't balance in your favor. You're just keeping it level. You're just keeping it level. You still need... Jesus, amen? We still need Jesus. But notice the nature of it. He says, for we are God's handiwork. He's speaking collectively and corporately to the Ephesian gathering. In 2 Timothy 1.7, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, for the spirit God gave us. It's not just you, Timothy. There's this corporateness here that God gave us his spirit, and it doesn't make us timid, but it gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Uh, John 1.12, yet to all who did receive him, to everyone that receives him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Everybody got that right. It was a corporate thing. It's not just an individual thing for you or for me. 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and 10, I, I hear this one preached a lot uh, uh, you know, and, and on quote lists when you want to know your identity in Christ. It says, but you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have. I love that passage, but it's not lost on me. You are a chosen people. He doesn't say you're a chosen person. Although you are a chosen person, but you're a chosen people. This is a corporate thing that we share in together. He says you are royal priesthood, not just you're a royal priest, although I do believe spiritually we are like royal priests individually, but he says there's a corporateness to it. We are a priesthood together. We're a priesthood together as a body. We've got special possession and so on. Once you were not a people, now you're a people, not once you weren't a person. Now you're a person. I was a person before I came to Jesus, but now I'm a people. Amen? Now I'm part of a people. I'm part of this thing that Paul lovingly calls the very body of Christ, the church. The body of Christ, the church. See, many people never discover their true identity in Christ because they struggle to embrace their identity in Christ's community. They don't want to be, in other words, we don't want to be a part of the body. We just want to be, we want our identity in Jesus, but we want it apart from identity in his community. And too many people are isolating themselves from community and trying to claim identity, but but you find identity in the context of community. You discover your identity, your identity becomes alive to you in the context of Christ's community. Some people don't want to be associated with the body. They try to maintain their own identity. They want to be apart from the body. But I am who I am, whether I want to embrace it or not, I'm part of the body. But, but so many people, and, and, and I don't want to go into too many details here, but, but, but you would all know people. And you've probably seen their Facebook posts or their rants on social media. Social media can be a great thing, but I'll tell you what, there's a bunch of garbage on that thing. And, and it breaks my heart every time I see somebody coming on with a cryptic, super spiritual quote on social media that just tells me enough that you're more spiritual than the rest of us and, and, and maybe the rest of us that, that turn up on a Sunday to church that still believe that, that Jesus died for our sins, that, that maybe still read a Bible or pray or maybe we still give uh, to, to, our, to our churches so that we can do the work of God in the community. Oh, those kinds of people where you're just not quite there yet. You haven't got that level of spiritual understanding. And so I'm going to distance myself from you guys with my social media quotes and all the things I put out there just so everybody that reads knows that I, I wanna, I, I'm a Christian, but I'm not part of them. I'm a believer, but I don't, I'm not with them. And we want to distance ourselves. Breaks my heart when I see people doing that. I, I always go back to what Paul said. Paul said this. He said, um, 
all things are all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. Amen. You can do that. You can get on social media and you can create distance between yourself and the mainstream church if you want to. You can do that. It's permissible, but ask yourself first, is this beneficial? What are people thinking that are looking at that stuff online? What are they thinking? What are people thinking who are on there going, oh, I'm interested. Maybe there's some truth in this Jesus thing. Maybe there's something to, to, to the death. Maybe I'm going to jump on and I see this post. Oh, wow. So there's kind of a, a real body and then a fake body. and a... We're one. We're one. But some people want to distance themselves from, from, you know, it's almost like the word traditional is like a swear word now, you know? Traditional sexual ethic is wrong. Uh, traditional view of marriage is wrong. Uh, traditional um, uh, view on the death, burial, resurrection of Christ is wrong. Or it's like we've got this super spiritual enlightenment now that's coming back upon the church where we're so incredibly enlightened that all those things that we believe for thousands of years of Christian orthodoxy now just don't seem to matter anymore. We're trying, trying to find loopholes around them all so that we can still be who we want to be. We can still be cool, but still be kind of Christian. We can still be cool, but be a part of the body. I want to be in the body, but not really in the body. It's almost like I want to have an out-of-body experience. So I'm in the body, but I'm out of the body. So whatever the body's doing over there, I'm making sure that I'm very different to them. Making sure that everybody knows I'm very different to them. Yeah, this is one of the downsides of online church. Some people can do that with online church. And I, I, I mean, we, we live stream and we have a YouTube channel and all that stuff. And we've had some amazing testimonies from people that, that physically, for various reasons, are unable to get to a fellowship. And, and, and so I think the technology, we looked at cutting it a while ago until we, we, we got a call from a lady whose husband had been uh, watching us in rural Victoria and he'd, he'd been watching us for about two years and he passed away. And just that week when we were praying and talking about, let's get rid of it. Because I, I don't like the thought that I'm enabling people to not be a part of the body physically. Anyway. That, that week when we were going to scrap it, we got this phone call and this woman's in tears on the phone going, my husband just passed away. I want to say thank you for being there. He connected with your community via that and so on and couldn't get to a church, had anxiety issues and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, so praise God, I'm, I'm all for it. But I also, uh, uh, the, the side of it I hate is that if, if people use it as a way to not have to come along and connect in and be a part of the body. They don't want to be a part of the body. They'll tell you, they'll, they'll say they're a part of the body. But I'm telling you that, that if you disconnect yourself from the body, if you want to find your true identity in Christ, uh, what I read in the New Testament is our truest, uh, uh, the, the fullest expression and understanding and revelation of our identity is not going to be found by distancing ourselves from the body. Amen? It's not going to be found by distancing ourselves from the body. And every person in this room has a reason why they should disconnect themselves from the body. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. Every one of us have a reason. Somebody in the church said this to me, or somebody in the church did that to me, or somebody, somebody uh, uh, did this to my friend, or somebody did that to that person, or I read about that pastor that's ripping people off, or I saw that guy that you know, fell in that. And We've all got reasons, every one of us, if we want to go that way, we've all got reasons why. But it's so funny, we don't do that with sport, do we? How many, how many sports coaches have been found out in the last couple of years, international sports coaches who are being inappropriate and different in various ways with money or physically with children and gymnastic coaches and water polo and all this stuff, yet none of us are pulling our kids out of sport and going, we want nothing to do with sport ever again because look what coaches do. But all it takes is one person in a church to do one wrong thing and, oh, I'm never going to church again. Oh, I hate those people. Come on, let's grow up. Seriously? Eh? Eh? Let me tell you something. If you haven't been hurt by somebody in a church yet, just open your eyes and look around. It'll probably happen before you get in your car today. You know why? Because we're all sinners in need of a saviour. We're saved by grace. None of us are perfect. And we're all on a journey. Okay? It, it's funny. It's almost like... Here's a, uh, this is a rabbit trail. But it's almost like... It's almost like I, I read in, the, in, in, in um, you know, Galatians, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, generosity, self-control, all this stuff. But if I'm honest, I want a world around me. I want my bubble, so my mother-in-law and my, my wife and my, my friends that I come into contact with and my children. I want a bubble created around me where I never, ever have to exercise any of those things. <laughs> I don't want to have to be patient with you. Just create a world where I don't even need patience, Jackie. That's your job. Just, oh, she says she does. Um, and I'm not going to argue publicly with her. I will not do that. But it's almost like we've got this, the fruit of the Spirit, love. Well, well love kind of comes to the fore when? When you probably don't feel like being loving. Amen? You've got to have an environment where you don't feel like loving in order for love to be a real thing. Otherwise, it's just a blah. 
If you want to be patient, guess what? You, you, people go, I want to be patient. Well, guess what? You're going to, be, you're going to have to be in, in, in environments where you have the capacity to be very impatient in order for patience to become a real thing in your life. You really want patience? Anyone praying for patience? Guess what? You're going to be surrounded by impatient opportunities. It's just the way it is. You can't, otherwise, it's just a blur. It's a nothing, right? You want joy? Guess what? Things are going to happen around your world that are not going to be things that draw joy out of you. They're going to be things that want to squash joy down, and you're going to have to find a way to let joy out. Peace. You want peace. There are going to be things that are going to come into your world that will take you the opposite way of peace. That is just the way it works. Sometimes we read this stuff and go, oh, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kind of goodness. Oh, they're so nice and beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. We got these things. God, in the Spirit, I have them all. <laughs> and then soon as somebody... Cut you off in traffic. <laughs> Hang on a second. Let the fruit out, people. Come on. We want to create this world around us of perfection and sweetness and beauty and, and, and where it's basically easy for us to be believers. We want to create a world around us where we don't really need to deny the flesh, where we don't really need to put on Christ, where we don't really need to choose to walk in the Spirit as opposed to allowing the flesh to dominate and take control. If we're brutally honest, or maybe I'm the only one, Maybe I'm the only one in this room, but if we're brutally honest, it's a struggle and it's a reality. Might get the guys to come back. We'll finish up. Run out of time here. This is what rabbit trails do for you. Hmm. C.S. Lewis said this once. He said, if you're worried about the people outside, speaking about a world out there that do not know Jesus, who, who thinks about Eternity for people that don't know Christ. There's, I'm reading that, that, that book, 1,300 People Praying in Lismore, and I'm thinking, man, you know why that was happening? Because there was a real move of the Holy Spirit in our community once. 1,300 people. In, in a, in, that's just a prayer meeting, by the way. I mean, you know, nowadays I think most churches, if you can get 20 people to a prayer meeting, we feel like it's revival. You know? There's 1,300 people. God's doing amazing things. And God wants to do more than just things inside the four walls of a building. Amen? I, I, I believe most of what God wants to do. The, um, I think it was, um, um, who was it? T uh, Tolkien. No, not Tolkien. What's his name? A.W. Tozer. Tozer said this once about the church. He said, he said, the church is not necessarily a place to bring your unsaved friends in to get saved. He said it's a refueling station for Christians to come on in, put the Bowser in, get yourself filled up again and go out into the world. Amen? C.S. Lewis said this. He said, if you're worried about the people outside, the most unreasonable thing you can do is remain outside yourself. Christians are Christ's body. Every addition to that body enables him to do more. If you want to help those outside, you must add your own little cell to the body of Christ. Get connected. Get connected. who alone can help them. Cutting off a man's fingers would be an odd way of getting him to do more work. K.P. Yohannan, who founded Gospel for Asia, said this, the single most important hindrance to world evangelization right now is the lack of total involvement by the body of Christ. And I'll, I'll amen that thing. We want to see God do great things and we want to, you know, but we also want our distance. We want the world and all it has to offer and also we want all this to offer too. And sometimes those, those two things rub against each other and you've got to choose. What do you want? What's, 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 what's going to get you to know Christ more? What's going to help you know him more? What's going to help us know Christ more? Paul had made his mind up. He was very clear. See, the single most foundational element of Christian identity is first and foremost that we've been placed together into a body. It's so important to Paul in his theology that Paul told the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 12, he says this, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. That's connection, people. That's connection. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. If we truly want to understand our own identity, the starting point is to realise that you're a part of a body. 
you're a part of a body. From there, you can unpack individual identity. You can unpack individual call. From there, you unpack individual purpose, individual contribution. Are you an ear or a hand or a finger or an eye or so on? Every part of the body does its share and the body grows, it talks about. But too many people don't want to be parts of the body. They'd rather be a prosthetic limb. They can take themselves off whenever they feel like it. I've made a decision that I'm in the church for the good, the bad, and the ugly. And there's lots of bad, and I've seen plenty of ugly. But I'll tell you what, the good's really good. Amen? The good's really good. We've got to stop distancing ourselves. The reason why you don't feel content, the reason why you don't feel that you can really embrace and walk in your identity, because you haven't embraced the foundational starting point, which is first and foremost, God has put us together in a body. Our Christian identity is not an accessory. It's not like earrings or a handbag or something like that. It's got to be at the forefront of who we are. And that's very easy in theory, but it's not so easy in practice, and it does take effort. Rich Mullins. Anyone love Rich Mullins? The late, great Rich Mullins, a Christian singer. If you don't know him, listen to some of his music. Amazing. Rich Mullins said this. He said, The hardest part of being a Christian is surrendering. And that is where the real struggle happens. Once we have overcome our own desire to be elevated our own desire to be recognized, our own desire to be independent and all those things that we value very much. Once we've overcome that struggle, then God can use us as a part of his body to accomplish what the body of Christ was left here to accomplish. Let's all stand up. Christian identity is received. It's not achieved, people. We receive it. The prodigal son had his identity given to him. He certainly didn't earn it. But he didn't fully realise it either until he returned home. When he came home, he had a perfect father, but he was in the same room as an imperfect brother. Amen? But he came home anyway. He went back. He took up his place as a son. And I love that picture because that's the church. We've got a perfect father. But tell you what, there are some ratbag people running around inside of the house. Some think they're better than others. Some think they're doing better. Some think they've got the right to earn. Others feel like they're that bad. They shouldn't be. But it's the grace and mercy of the Father. It's the grace and mercy of the Father that holds us all together as a body. Amen? You'll continue to struggle to embrace your identity in Christ until the day you begin to embrace your identity in His community, the church.